Welcome to IEP Radio, a show dedicated to the education of all things indoor environmental quality related. And now here's your host, Michael Schrantz. Hello, everybody, and welcome to IEP Radio. This is episode four. We're going to be talking about the fundamentals of mold remediation and environmental cleaning, and this is going to be a four-part series. So this is going to be part one of that four-part, and really it's just an overview today uh, talking about, you know, what does a remediation project look like when we're talking about mold or bacteria, that sort of thing. Uh, we're not going to be diving into too much detail on this topic. This is just to give those who are unfamiliar with the process an idea, uh, but the Parts that will follow down the road, we'll get into the deeper topics on remediation, cleaning, and validating the work that's been done for you. And to help me get this topic nailed down really well, I'm, I'm welcoming a special guest today. His name is Dustin Anderson. He's a good friend and colleague of mine, uh, works out of Tucson, Arizona. Uh, he owns a company uh, called Advanced Drying. I'm going to uh, share my screen here in a moment to uh, uh, show you his uh, website. And... Uh, tell you a little bit about him. I've, I've known uh, Dustin for, uh, geez, I, I want to say since 2011, 2012, he may correct me, but I uh, bumped into him under a situation where we were working with a mutual client, client and it was one of those deals where, you know, you want to make sure you're working with the right people. Uh, they have their heart in the right place, that they're doing honest work. We're all learning. We're all working together on this village and chronic illness, and it's a lot of it's uncharted territory. You know, how far do we go? How much cleaning? How much money do you spend? And um, the short version of that real long story is that we just hit it off. Uh, we became great friends along the way um, and we're able to really separate uh, church from state or friendship from the professional work that we do. It's been a really uh, great experience and I thought Dustin would be a great guy to come to on the show today, share his experience and give you a little bit of what he does on a daily basis. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Dustin. Hi, Mike. How are you? Thanks for having me. Ah, you bet, man. I know we were talking a little bit before the show about fundamentals, and I thought maybe we'd start with giving the uh, audience a little bit about your background. Um, no, you've been doing this for, you've been doing this for longer than your company's been in business. I think the advanced drying opened up in around 2010, but you've been doing this before that, right? Yeah, I have, uh, I've been in the restoration industry now for uh, probably about 15 years, uh, 16 years. Uh, started off, uh, just as a technician for a company here in town and uh, quickly went through the ranks and learned quite a bit. And um, after, uh, after getting my feet with that, I ended up running uh, a water restoration company uh, that was between here and, and Phoenix. And uh, from that, I got into textile restoration, uh, ended up running a, C, uh, a CRDN franchise and opened up Southern Arizona. And, uh, Dabbled in that for a while and, and, and grew that business and, uh, and then decided that I wanted to do something for myself and I didn't like how other people were doing things. So I said, you know, why not give it a shot myself? So here I am. And that's, and that's where the passion was for you. I mean, it was like, uh, you, it was just, you're, you're out there doing work for other people. You're dealing with people's health and lives, trying to find improvement. Um, I know, obviously I know a little bit about uh, your, your background and You've been affected to some degree a little bit by this. I'm not saying that you have CIRS or anything, but it may be a little bit closer to heart with you about the, the, the passion and work involved with what you do because of your own health, right? I mean, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. you have a couple of the markers that are out there. So I don't know how much time you want me to spend on this, but <laughs> um, i try to try to summarize this as quickly as I can. Uh, Yes, uh, I am passionate about what I do. If I do something, I want to do it. Uh, I want to do it the right way, and I want to try to be as good as I can possibly be at something. Um, that being said, when I opened up Advanced Drying, it wasn't in, it wasn't intent uh, intended to service people that were, um, you know, sensitive individuals or had CRS. I mean, at that time, you know, that wasn't even I don't even know if it was even known or not. But uh, uh, when I when we got into it, I believe the customer that kind of launched me uh, in this direction, uh, I don't even know if I can use her name or not, but uh, there's use a lady here. In town. <laughs> uh, Chris, you remember Iris? Yeah, I do actually. Okay. So Iris uh, was the lady that would, you know, basically drive, drive in her car with the mask and the gloves on. And you would look at that individual and not knowing any better, you go, man, I, you know, are they just crazy or what? But um, it turns out that this was probably one of the brightest women I think I've ever met in my life. And uh, 
she had a, a water damage issue in her house and, and we did find mold and we uh, handled it and treated it appropriately for her. And that's when uh, I got you involved on in that project and it kind of opened her eyes to this. And um, after we did that project, I started getting calls from people uh, that were basically um, you know, more sensitive to mold issues. And then I uh, started asking, how'd you hear about us? Uh, well, my doctor referred me to you. Okay, well, who's your doctor? So uh, I ended up scheduling and making an appointment with Dr. Mary Ackerley just so I could figure out what's going on with all this. And uh, in, in, I, in my visit, I believe you're with me on that one, weren't you, Mike? I could have been on the very first one or I, you may have had a follow-up because all I remember is I ended up following suit after you. Okay, so I, I, think I, I think we both met with her together the first time. And uh, she ended up suggesting that I get some testing done. So uh, actually, I think we both did it. And uh, so I went down, they, you know, they drew about 500 vials of blood for me. I, a lot of people here office. can relate to that. Yep. Uh, and, and then, you know, a couple of weeks later, I, I get the, uh, the phone call, you know, you have two dreaded genes. And uh, I'm so happy that I found a, a good remedial guy that can service my customers, my clients, my patients. But uh, you really need to find something else to do is what she told me. And um, I, I, you know, it, it's, to me, it's kind of like the cobbler's son, right? You know, you're always fixing everyone else's shoes and your shoes are kind of worn through and, you know, hitting the, hitting the dirt. So um, actually, uh, I'm feeling pretty good today, but two days ago, I was laid up in bed with a pretty bad sinus infection um, and I get them quite a bit. Uh, and so it's, um, yeah, it's just not, it's not a lot of fun sometimes, but uh, uh, you know, there, there's a, uh, a piece of this where you get to help people that are really in need. And um, it's almost like by the time that I meet people, they're kind of at the end of the, they're, they're on their last straw, you know, it's like, this is the, this is the, the straw that breaks the camel's back. And it's unfortunate that I get to meet a lot of people in a, almost a desperation. Uh, are you running off the camera there? Yeah, no, sorry. Um, I was just trying to fix my screen. Keep going. You're good. So that's that's pretty much that in a nutshell. Uh, getting to meet a lot of people, uh, you get emotionally involved with your clients as much as you try not to. Um, it's hard for me not to be empathetic with other people's situations when uh, I know full well, uh, or I can I, I can be empathetic to what they're going through just because of my own experiences. So, absolutely, I think um, I think that's what it takes. This industry, um, we work with people that are so emotionally involved and connected uh, in their own lives. They're spending a lot of money. They're, there's, there's, so there's financial hardship. Uh, there's an emotional hardship. Um, and then there's just that feeling of being lost in general. Um, you know, uh, they, they'll ask 10 professionals uh, of an opinion of what to do and they'll get 15 responses. And it's confusing and it's expensive. And a lot of times the work that's done is not something that you can immediately get validation from. It's like if you go spend two grand on a really big screen, t uh, flat screen TV, at least you know there's something you've gotten for it and you feel like there's been some level of satisfaction. A lot of times the work that you do, especially the work you do, and we're certainly in the same boat, is not always appreciated um, and certainly not immediately. And that's one of the challenges is that we know certain work needs to get done. Uh, there's certain damage in a home, but how far do you go? And um, uh, what, how do you well, deal with some of those limitations? And that, that topic, certainly, I mean, uh, talking about uh, meeting people kind of at the, um, you know, uh, kind of the end of, end of it, and they're, you know, they're kind of at their last straw, and it's, you know, um, it's almost a, uh, it's really difficult a lot of times when you walk into these situations, because, you know, obviously people have spent so much money, or they hired other restoration companies, in fact, and they've had failed uh, remedial attempts or what have you, but generally speaking, when you get on a job, the, the hard part is, is um, and I've, I've walked into somebody's home uh, and, and, and basically they, they throw their checkbook on the counter and they say, do whatever you need to do, just fix my house. And it's like, you know, carte blanche, have at it. And that's where you and I, we've, we've kind of, uh, uh, if, I'm being, uh, if I'm being real, we've kind of butted heads a little bit over the, over the past couple uh, years because, um, you know, you and I are both passionate and care about what we do. And for me, um, I, I have to know that whatever I'm doing is justified. And so that's where you come in. Uh, and a lot of these clients that we meet when we walk into their house and there's been no testing done, um, you know, we obviously see that there's a couple of what I call flat tires, which is an obvious uh, damage. And, you, you know, 
you don't necessarily need to test the flat tire at the beginning of it, but you'd want to certainly test it at the end to make sure it falls within spec, so to say. But aside from the, uh, the flat tires, I call them, uh, the other areas that uh, you like to use word suspect and uh, any areas that are suspect or uh, that we're looking at. And we're not quite sure of uh, from the stance of the communication. And I always like to establish some sort of baseline. So that way um, it'll help me put together a scope of work, um, set expectations with the customer. So we both know what we're looking at where everyone's on the same page. And um, that gets, uh, gets a little bit more defined when you become involved because then uh, based off the testing and the data provided, uh, you have a, a great way to interpret that and help in the recommendations uh, in, in which we design that scope off of. Well, you, you, you bring up a great, uh, a few great points actually, and it's actually a good opportunity for us to transition into today's topic because you're touching on the subject of guidance, even for you as a professional, just goes to show that it's not just the client or the patient that's confusing, not where, sure where to start. It's, it's start. It's also where you are like, where I, you know, people are asking me to, you know, do environmental cleaning in my house and they're basing it off of maybe something they read online or a friend or some social media or something legit. And it's just, again, it's tricky. Do this for us, um, for you, because I know everyone's experience is a little bit different, but clearly you've been doing this for a long time and you've worked with a lot of the clients that are actually listening right now. What, how does a typical job start for you? I mean, I don't want to get too corny, but I mean, is it a phone call to you? Someone says, I got a water loss. Where, where do you start in their lives? We start at hello every time. Yeah. No, uh, <laughs> it, 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 everyone's in a different scenario position. And depending on where I'm getting brought in at that particular point, it could be that you met with a client. Um, you discover that they have some issues that definitely need some remedial work and you don't even test because you obviously know there's a, an issue going on. And, uh, so what's an example of that? Like five, uh, a, you know, visible mold growth underneath the kitchen sink cabinet, right? Something like that. Right, right, right. Something like that. Something very obvious. So we, we call condition three, which is when there's exposed mold that's, you know, for the eye to see and potentially can uh, spread around or, you know, something that's really viable, right? Um, it gets a little bit more tricky when everything's hidden and you know, it's in between walls and you can't see it. That's when, that's when this get that this, this job becomes more challenging. And, and you know, it'd be really easy if uh, there is an X on every single wall that was affected. And all I had to do is come in, set a containment and rip it out. Uh, but essentially by doing cavity sampling and doing other testing, it kind of helps identify those areas and put the X on the wall, if you will. However, um, getting back to how do we originally get in, um, I, I have a lot of different clients ranging from uh, an insurance agent recommends them to, you know, from a water loss or a roof leak or what have you. And um, uh, if it's something where, you, you know, the, the water loss just happened, you have this window of time where you can get in, you can dry things out appropriately. And um, you're not overly concerned with uh, microbial growth just because of the nature of the, the water loss and, and also the time that it took to dry it up. So that out right there, that just flags for the, for the audience that time, timing, certainly, and the source of the moisture matters. Oh, absolutely. So in the, um, in the ISDRC, which is kind of the restoration Bible, you really have a copy in front of you, um, there are specific guidelines within what restoration companies work off of. And so they have what they call category of a loss. And a category of a loss basically describes, oh, there we go. Uh, describes what type of loss it was. And then um, with a category loss, uh, you can also have, uh, well, you, you can either have either a fresh water, uh, which is a category or, or you know, category one. Uh, uh, category two would be a gray water situation where the water is, you know, not sanitary, you probably wouldn't want to drink it. And uh, <clears throat> a cat three or category three would be you know, grossly unsanitary, uh, you know, more or less like a sewage type thing. So you can have a, a fresh water loss that happens. And if it goes untreated or ignored um, or undiscovered, uh, time and temperature determine everything. So typically every 24 hours goes by that category one can now turn into a category two because now you're allowing for microbial growth and things to happen. And then as it goes another 24 hours, uh, you know, then, then you can go into what we call cat three. And so based off the industry standard and guidelines, anything that's a category three, 
uh, any porous materials need to be basically cut and removed. And so whether it be a sewage loss or if we're talking, uh, you know, the, the, the fear of uh, microbial growth, and you, you handle it accordingly. And then you can also use antimicrobial agents uh, in dealing with it if, um, if you get to these losses relatively quickly. Um, you know, chances are, you, you know, or if it's a one-time event, uh, chances are you're going to be able to get everything dried out and taken care of before there becomes a major issue. So let, uh, let me the catch the audience, let me catch the audience, not to interrupt you, Dustin, because these are fantastic. Oh, yeah, no. Is for the audience, what we're talking about is, you know, it, for the, especially those who are just not familiar with this or unfortunately are going through it. It starts with contacting a remediation company and there's resources you can go to. We'll try to talk about that more later. But the, the point is, is um, you contact them and they're communicating. It's like, what's the type of leak? Well, it was a plumbing line underneath my kitchen sink when it happened about three hours ago. You know, Dustin's painting the picture is that nothing's for sure. Nothing's an exact science, but we use rule of thumbs. And if something happens that quick, they're going to probably come in there and treat it like a water loss where they're focusing on more of a dry out procedure. They're not necessarily setting up containments, which we'll get into. I'll have Dustin kind of walk us through that. I got a couple of photos to kind of guide and aid, but, but it's, 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 it's important to establish that because it kind of sets the tone for the rest of the project. I mean, if you have a company that's coming out there and, and I want to go, I don't want to go eight levels deep, but Dustin can probably talk volumes on this. Um, one of the issues is, is if you do have insurance, um, you want the coverage, but unfortunately uh, for those that carry insurance, uh, a lot of it's limited to more of a water loss related. And there's, if there's any coverage for mold or microbials, there'll be some sort of a, a cap, a really small amount, if any. Sometimes I think it's becoming more of a thing where it's phasing out to where it's just not covered because of some of the gross negligence and other issues that we deal with, unfortunately. Some of the bad apples we have who take advantage of insurance work, uh, that's going away. But that, that matters, right? Because if you are living paycheck to paycheck, but you do have home insurance and they cover water loss, um, but they don't cover mold, you may be working with a remediation company uh, who wants to get paid. And so they may try to come at this from uh, not the best approach that has your interest in mind. They may try to do it from more of a that gray area, just kind of treat it like a water loss when maybe they should have set up containment. So understanding origin, uh, source of the water, uh, timing when it occurred is really important uh, because it sets the tone and just in general speaking, so remember this is just an overview conversation today. We can dive deeper on the rest of the series here later on. Um, if you get to it with less than 24 hours and it's a clean water, it's like a supply line leak, you, you, you can kind of come into that. You don't have to necessarily freak out. A little caveat to that is, you know, it's also relative to where it leaked into. I mean, it, you, you have to consider, did that clean water leak into a a moldy environment that was there before. Um, so initial inspection and having boots on the ground, and maybe that's where I can segue you, Dustin, if you're willing, willing to help here. Maybe that's part of the things that the audience needs to hear is when they call you up, it's important for you to go out there and check the job, right? Because it could have been a leak that happened in less than 24 hours, but maybe the circumstances would have somebody like you, especially working with people who have chronic illness, that sort of thing, to be more proactive and set up containment. Can you give an example of that? Sure. Um, you know, I, I get calls all the time uh, from somebody just calling me up and saying, you know, I, I have mold in my house. How much does it cost to take care of it? And I say, well, uh, you know, it could be $500 to $100,000. How big is your home? You know, I mean, uh, and, and it'd be like kind of calling a mechanic and saying, my, my car's making a funny noise. How much does it cost to fix it? Well, without them looking at it, they're going to have no idea. Um, we you know everything everything is is basically its own unique situation i don't think i've ever seen one thing that's just exactly alike um uh, and so you know it requires putting eyes on there and then there's the responsibility of the remedial company when they get out there to ask the appropriate questions you know and the, the appropriate questions even if i am going out for a water loss um that maybe supposedly just happened um and the customer tells me that, you know, I have CRS or I'm sensitive or my kids have respiratory issues or my kids have asthma or that really, really bad allergies or what have you. Um, I'm not a doctor. It's not my job to try to, to try to figure out their ailments. But what I can do is say, well, while I'm working in their house, um, what's going to be the best way for me to not turn a bad situation into a worse situation? And if I feel that uh, we need to set a containment up, 
um, and maybe throw an air scrubber in there and a water loss, which a lot of, a lot of insurance companies wouldn't pay for that uh, just because um, it doesn't jive with their criteria for what they would cover in a water loss because, you know, they're, why are we going to pay for equipment used for mold jobs when, when you were just doing a water loss? Well, if the occupants have upper respiratory conditions, I'm not going to risk it. And, you know, it's uh, because the insurance company doesn't want to pay for it. Does that mean that if a person gets sick, are they going to sue the insurance company because they pay for it? Are they going to sue me because I didn't do it? Right. And so, you know, it, there, there's a lot of um, uh, just making sure that you, you try to go above and beyond. I mean, it, it's, you know, some things are easily recognizable and then other people uh, kind of hold their, their clothes, their, their, their uh, cards a little closer to their chest and they don't share so much information. You almost have to try to really get some info out of them just to make sure that you're uh, doing the appropriate thing for the appropriate situation. But you know, the, the, the whole insurance could be um, a whole episode on its own. Um, oh that, yeah. We'll, that we'll have a, one, I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah, that can be uh, a lot tricky to navigate. Um, I, what I would just encourage everyone here listening to do is to uh, look over your your current insurance policy and uh, find out if mold or fungi fungi growth uh, is an exclusion of your policy. And if it is, maybe shop for uh, an insurance policy that does have it, or you can purchase it as a writer. Um, it does cost a little bit of money to have it on there, but in the event that you need it um, and you you have it, it'll definitely be uh, uh, well worth the money you spent. Um, Dustin, I want to I want to I want to not to interrupt you, but I want to just say that you're touching on the heart of something so important to 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 IEP Radio and to the audience members, and I just want to thank you for that. And that's it. Just goes to show right off the bat, we haven't even in our in our story, we haven't even got inside of your home really. I mean, we're we're about to in our in our narr you know in our story here, um, but that. It just goes to show just because an industry may have a, an expectation of, oh, we're treating this like a water loss, there are other things to consider. And we're not claiming that we understand, um, you know, exactly what can cause uh, inflammation or an adverse health response uh, in your life. You're, you're this person who has an environmentally acquired illness. Um, uh, you're susceptible to the environment. You know, maybe it's not mold that's an issue. Maybe it's when they start cutting open drywall, the gypsum dust. Uh, and the particles associated with that, anything else that comes with it is enough to cause some sort of an adverse response. It's about erring on the side of caution, but using science to understand that, oh yeah, yeah that makes sense. You know, it, it doesn't make sense to necessarily taint your house um, and to, you know, gut everything uh, because you had a four ounce glass of water spill in the corner in the living room. But going above and beyond, uh, if that's the word we're going to use or the term to describe setting up a containment from an area that leaked because safe, Say, I'll pick on Dustin because he's here. He goes out to the house and yeah, it was a recent leak. You can even buy that, um, that it occurred. There doesn't seem to be any damage or indication of microbial growth. But the problem is, is that in order to explore that particular area or dry it out adequately, you may end up disturbing interstitial spaces or building materials that will take what was relatively an isolated event, still a concern, and create an order of magnitude problem that didn't exist. So how do we avoid that? Well, we communicate. It's like we're doing right now. And we're talking with these people. It's like, all right, fine. So in plain English, if I do have insurance and they don't cover that, you may have to pay a little bit out of, out of pocket. And if you're fortunate enough, and I'm not just plugging Dustin, I mean this because I've seen him do it time and time again. If you're fortunate enough to meet somebody like Dustin, he'll work with you financially uh, where, where he's able to help you because what's more important to him than making money uh, and, and, and paying his own bills like we all have, it's doing the right job and living with himself at the end of the day. So uh, good on you uh, for that, Dustin. Thank you for the bit on the insurance. And um, I don't know if you have any other tidbits. Uh, if you do, please share. I wanted to walk the clients with, okay, now that you've uh, got into the home, uh, how do you develop a scope of work? How do you communicate up front so they know what they're kind of getting themselves into? Okay. Um, and certainly too, I don't, uh, I don't know if you could, you could always share my phone number. If anyone's got any in-depth or crazy situations that they want to go over with. I have no problem doing that with them or trying to be an advocate for them. Um, however, uh, once you, once you get into them, you just, you ask the right questions, which, you know, does anybody here in the house have any kind of health issues? You know, um, uh, and then a lot of this is the, the company that will come out, will have a work authorization that they typically go through. I know they'll explain, um, what you're doing and why you're doing it. And, uh, 
if we do run into a mold situation, I even have a, a hold harmless document. So we go through a hold harmless, mold hold, hold harmless document with everybody that, that we do a job for. And the document is actually geared uh, and, and states that you would not be doing any testing at the end of the job. And so uh, if you decided not to do testing, that you would hold us harmless. So uh, even from a standard water loss all the way up into, you know, a very large mold remedial project, we go through that form with everybody. And we uh, acknowledge and uh, explain to them that there is the availability of pre-testing to establish a baseline. Um, and then there is also clearance testing available to them at the end of the day so we can actually clear a project to make sure that things are done and fall within industry guidelines or what we call TFE, typical fungal ecology. So, and that would be, you know, your, your, your boat. Once we go through that, then we proceed, we do the job. Um, a so walk, times, walk them through this. I mean, are we talking, I, I obviously I set this up uh, on purpose to help uh, me out a little bit, but we are talking about the different uh, things. I mean, I, I don't know if this is going to be helpful, Dustin, if it's not, just let me know. But I kind of have like some basic idea of containment layouts, things like that. Some of these people don't have a clue. When you say remediation, they think you're talking about a bottle of bleach and, and a terry cloth. So, all right. I, so if you, if you use bleach, you shouldn't. Um, and I think it's still on EPA, what EPA website, but, uh, yeah, sodium hydrochloride, never a good idea. Um, you know, if, if you, if you do have mold, I would just recommend getting a remedial company out there, uh, pretty much interview them for the job. I mean, everyone's going to do their job. How well they are, are they going to explain it to you what they're going to do? So, um, if we go, if we go back up to that picture there where we have yeah. that full blown container. Yeah, you got it. So we'll, we'll walk you through. So. So pretty much we've identified an area in this room, let's say, and, uh, and, and there, there is a mold situation. So a containment gets put up. That's going to be a six millimeter plastic. Uh, a lot of them will have a zipper or some type of flap. But then the most important thing is if you look at the window down below the first picture, the second picture there, you're going to see this tube and it looks like it's running through a piece of plywood. So generally uh, what will be on the other end of that tube uh, is what's called a negative air machine. And so a negative air machine consists of pre-filters and it consists of uh, a large HEPA filter. And what it will do is it'll take air from that environment inside the containment, it will exhaust it, uh, preferably outdoors. And it is gonna be a filtered air that's being exhausted outdoors. So you don't have to worry about, you know, if you contaminating your neighbors or things, or your dog's gonna get sick from it or something like that. Um, it might have a smell to it, but it, you're, you're going to be capturing a lot of the, uh, the spores or, you know, pretty much the 99. Yeah, you're going to be capturing most of it uh, and most of all of it in the HEPA filter. So the, the reason why this is important and having a uh, containment under negative pressure is because we want to control, uh, control that environment. And if we can, if we can effectively uh, put a negative pressure on this containment where the containment will almost suck into itself, um, uh, anytime that you open anything up or something will go in the air, it's got less likelihood or chance for it to go outside of that containment. So and let me, t let me, cool. let me tag in right there real quick. I just want, I don't want the audience to, to misinterpret something. Um, the, it's Dustin's spot on, uh, negative air, uh, controls, uh, we're trying to create a, a pressure brown, a boundary, if I can speak, uh, across the envelope of the containment. So that's that plastic you see your, your, this photo is taken from outside of a containment. Um, and so it's not under negative air in this particular area, but it, imagine if it was, and it would be sucking inward. What I want folks to understand, and it's not a guarantee, just because someone has it under negative air doesn't mean that large particles can't come out. The, the primary use of the negative air uh, when it creates that boundary, and there's different levels of measure, measurements. You may hear things like Pascal readings or inches of water column. And we usually use Pascals just because I'm more familiar with it, maybe somewhere between like a negative two and a negative seven Pascal. There's that, that'll be uh, topics for uh, the other series that we'll be getting more into detail. But um, is that it's going to be really more able to remove the smaller stuff. So we talk about, and we've talked about before on podcasts about, it's not just about mold spores, you know, there's fragments, uh, there's other structures, certainly it's not just about mold, but there's different sizes. And we use the term aerodynamic diameter uh, of, of a particular, and it's going to be a uh, structure. And, and if it's smaller and it, and it acts more like smoke where it diffuses in the environment, that's going to be the type of particles that are predominantly going to be sucked out or at least filtered out through this negative air that Dustin brought up. You still need to have a structurally intact and sound containment 
with good procedures of entry and exit of the containment. Uh, this uh, containment actually is not the best example. It was a real one where there wasn't an easy way to set up a corridor. Imagine a containment hallway that was connected to that picture there so that the remediation company never even had to step foot in the home uh, outside of the containment. They could walk right from the sliding glass door of the backyard and go through this uh, little corridor containment that's in that six mil plastic Dustin mentioned and then they go right into the containment. Not every containment or not every job is going to be able to have that. So sometimes companies will use things like sticky mats. That's that little blue thing you see uh, down here in the bottom of the photo. It's just kind of a last resort. The guys are going to be wearing their Tyvek suits, their PPE to protect themselves. Uh, the workers, again, we can talk more about that on another podcast. But it's all about containing the work. And, 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 and negative air is a piece of the pie. Um, there are entry and exit procedures. You don't, you know, you don't want to leave the flap or the zipper open at all. Um, you, it's because there'll be particles that aren't going to necessarily stay in the containment um, uh, just because you have negative air or exhaust going to the outdoors. It's just, it's part of the whole. So sorry, Dustin, I didn't mean to interrupt you on that one, but I get a lot of clients who get confused about that. I have clients that think if you have negative air, you can just leave your door and flap open because that's what the remediation company told them. And I think it's some bad science. Yeah, you know, uh, what I've done in the past is if, in smaller containments, I mean, I, I, I use uh, a little bit larger machines than most people. And if the containment's really small, we have the availability to put a relief on the containment itself. So what we can do is we can actually uh, tape some pre-filters that we normally put in front of a machine up on the uh, plastic itself and kind of cut a, a door for there to be some relief air to actually make its way into the containment, why the zipper is closed. That's if the, if the pressure is too much. Um, the reason we do that is we definitely do not want the pressure to be so great that it would suck that containment all the way down. Rip it off uh, <laughs> the wall. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I've had, I've had it happen. Uh, uh, you know, and it's one of those moments where your heart falls out of your chest because, you know, here you got a containment coming down and you're in the middle of a project. I mean, uh, I, I think it's, I think it's happened to just about everybody and it's never a fun thing. So, uh, what we generally do is we use this, you know, really, really sticky double-sided duct tape um, and we staple into drywall. And so, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's at such a point to where when you when we remove the, uh, the containment down after the project's clearanced out and tested and everything's good, we're pulling the containment down. It's taken the paint off the wall and it's taken pieces of drywall off the wall. I mean, you know, it's, it's pretty serious stuff, but, you know, it's... Um, that stuff is easily fixed. You know, when a containment comes down in a project and you have to clean a whole house, that's a, that's a whole other story. <laughs> certainly, so, they, certainly that question comes up is now do I have to clean my own ho house? And at a very minimum, it can be an expensive proposition because now are we talking about testing and, and that sort of thing? So yeah, spot on, Dustin. All right. So, uh, you know, there, there are certain precautions that you want to take. And I've even gone to a point to where on certain projects we'll actually take uh, – like one by two uh, strips of wood and we'll actually screw them in uh, into the, uh, you know, the ceiling uh, just to help uh, hold up that top end of the containment. Cause when you're dealing with a high ceiling, that's, you know, 15, 16, 17 feet, uh, you know, the, the, the weight of the plastic and everything in it pulling down off of there is, is pretty great. So uh, anything that you can do to make sure that your containment stays up and, and you're going to have uh, a good solid containment uh, that's, Building that containment is the biggest thing because if you don't have a good containment, then, you know, whatever machine you have in there, whatever you're exhausting outdoors, whatever effort you put in past that, it doesn't matter anyway. So from a 30,000 foot perspective, what's the next step that we will say at, in this uh, part of the story that they do have a structurally sound containment, they have the engineering controls in place. I mean, are we getting right into this area right here where we're doing demo? I mean, we've had people I argue, uh, sorry, we have people arguing about like, you know, this, this is, not, again, probably not the best picture here because you can tell, and this isn't you guys, just for full validation, um, the, for, for the audience, this is not, none of these pictures are from uh, Dustin's work, um, but um, you can tell they're ripping out the drywall here. You can tell they're tearing it, the paper's coming off. Um, this may be reality, uh, what happens a lot, but a lot of companies will try to draw lines on the wall and cut clean lines, not just to help down the road for potential repair work. The, the guy doing the repair and restoration will thank the remediation company, but also because this guy used basically a hammer uh, and in that process kicked up way more. You're going you're gonna to disturb stuff, right, Dustin? Things are going to kick up. It's just a matter of 
from an orders of magnitude, how can we minimize that? Because it all trickles down to your work down the road when you're doing environmental cleaning and things. It's like what we do now can minimize the, uh, or can increase the chance of success of cleaning this environment right before we leave the containment. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, so, you know, there, there's a lot, a lot of different tricks you can do depending on the flooring that you have. A lot of times I like to put six mil plastic down on the floor and kind of tape it on the floor. And then that way when we do demo, um, you know, we will go through after the demo process and um, we'll basically uh, roll up the uh, six mil plastic uh, and kind of whatever's inside of it is kind of a burrito at that point. And so therefore, you know, it makes your cleaning efforts on the floor and everything a little bit, uh, a little bit easier, especially if it's tile and it's grout, uh, drywall can get in the, the grout. Um, you know, so, you, you know, whatever you can do to make your, make your life a little bit easier on the back end of things. So the and then uh, physical removal, I mean, drywall, fine. A lot of people can use that example of a porous material. It's got growth on it. What are we doing with studs? Just uh, again, the 30,000 foot, we don't have to talk about specific chemicals and things like that. We're going to get into that in the next, uh, series on this, but are we, are, are we, are we leaving that mold there? Are we sanding it down? What are we doing? So the the best thing that we can possibly do is remove every every uh, every bit of contaminant that we can. And uh, you know you well we'll probably talk about this later. But you've heard about the uh, the argument versus or, or you hear people say killing mold a lot. And uh, I don't like to kill anything. I just like to remove it. Right. Um, and so the 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 best uh, thing that we can potentially do is get in there. Um, open up and do our exploratory stuff. And even after we have a wall like that, well, you know, obviously uh, he's opened up the front part of that, in that first picture where your cursor's at, he's opened the front part of that wall. But if, if you notice that that growth that's on the drywall is actually on the back side of the drywall in the adjoining room. And so there you'll, you'll get into a lot of situations where you open up that wall and you go, oh, wow, this thing goes to the other room. And so you're in upsetting another containment in the other room. And so, uh, you know, going through with the hammer uh if i was to start beating that wall open with a hammer and what if my hammer accidentally went through the drywall on the other side of the wall now i put this big gaping hole in the other room without a containment up right so uh, what we do is we measure up and we typically uh uh snap some chalk lines and, and you know cut either at two or four foot depending on you know where we think this thing's going to land and then after you remove everything uh generally speaking you want to uh you want to basically go about another 18 inches or foot and a half uh, to determine uh, if, if anything, you know, continues on. And if it does, you just, you, you keep following it. But um, you know, once you go about another foot and a half past where it seems like the issue has stopped, uh, generally speaking, you're good enough. And then obviously off of visual cues, if you see anything else that looks a little bit off color or suspect, you uh, uh, look into that while you're in the containment as well. So let me park, um, let me let me interject another great point. It's uh, you you identified this issue of you. The industry doesn't have an exact line. Like we say, most remediation companies will remediate eighteen to twenty four inches beyond any evidence of water staining damage or microbial growth. Tear on the side of caution. Um, it, it's a rule of thumb, right? Because the logic is is that um, again, for those of you listening, you're like, what if you knew that there was visible mold growth that was only in one part, but you noticed the remediation company went a little bit further. There's, uh, that spidey sense is where you're wondering, are they trying to take advantage of me and charge me more money? Are they doing, are they doing what they're supposed to? The, the general reason for going a little bit beyond is because not all mold growth is going to be like what you see in that top photo. If you're, if you're not, if you're also watching the, not just listening, you'd see that there's this microbial growth that goes, you know, at least four feet up the wall. And um, you're going to go beyond that because there could be colonies of microbial growth that go beyond. And it's like, where do we draw the line? I mean, uh, you can you can appreciate as a listener if you have growth that's only a foot off the ground and the remediation company remediates the entire eight feet from a water loss that occurred at the floor, you may think that that's excessive. I mean, if, if every remediation project was like that, um, I mean, we'd be in a lot worse spot. No one would be able to afford that type of that work. And that's just a simplistic example. Certainly you can get more complicated, but what lo some companies will do is they, they, it's like Dustin said, uh, they'll go that extra bit just to make sure uh, within, uh, it's all about being pragmatic, about being reasonable. There's no guarantees in life, but um, you know, unless you want to turn your house into a study and spend millions of dollars to like check every little step, which is obviously not feasible, but 
what what I've also seen Dustin do uh, in the past is let's say he looks up a wall cavity. So on that bottom photo, there's a picture of a technician wearing PPE that's they're wiping down the studs now. They've already sanded them, things like that to physically remove, as Dustin said, uh, the growth. And a lot of times uh, uh, companies won't really do a good job doing that or they'll just HEPA vacuum and they'll leave like uh, mold structures that could have been removed with a little bit of elbow grease. I think that's really the secret, by the way, if you answer uh, any question about what's it take, it's elbow grease, which we'll get into. But you see that there's a part of the wall above that lady where they've actually plasticed it off. We'll talk about critical barriers when we get into more uh, detail on the uh, the series. But there's a part of the wall that clearly they didn't remediate and they probably didn't couldn't justify it. But I've seen companies like Dustin, they'll, they'll still take like their HEPA vacuum and they'll run their um, their vacuum hose as far as they can get up there, uh, especially if there's not something like insulation. And a lot of times they'll remove the insulation because it's suspect. But they'll insulate the ca- they'll uh, sorry they'll vacuum the cavity to at least go a little bit above and beyond because you know it's it's like a reservoir. It's kind of like uh, you know you're just trying to remove as much as you can. But it's all about being pragmatic and making sure that that makes sense. You know, uh, again, you can spend thousands upon thousands of dollars and. We have, as an industry, we're figuring out, you know, where do we go? And this, 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 these steps are pretty, you know, spelled out by a lot of uh, voluntary standards. There's not a lot of debate. You, you can talk about temperatures and in inches or how much, you know, cleaning do you do. But at the bottom line is you're doing this crude, kind of like this uh, step four here on the, on, the, on the screen shows this. Basically, it's, it, this is when the, the, well, basically the first two pictures that you're seeing there. This is where you're going to have the most disturbance. This is where you're going to be kicking up the most stuff. We're trying to get you into a clean, almost a pre-loss or pre-mold condition. But in order to do that, we have to have a way to get it out. So this is how they're doing it. Dustin, walk them through the step of, let's say that they're removing stuff physically. Uh, The top photo shows, you know, drywall just kind of on the ground. In reality, aren't we bagging this stuff, double bagging it, sealing it, and then somehow getting it out of the containment? We're not just tracking the stuff in and out on our feet into the living spaces of the home? Well, yeah, I mean, you bring up a good point uh, of what, one thing that I look at and when I'm doing this is an orientation of the containment versus, you know, where are my windows, where are my doors? A lot of times, um, you know, it, it just kind of depends on a technician's preference. I, I personally like to, to bag as I go. And uh, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll bag up and then I'll, I'll get kind of my, my trash or my bags, if you will, um, bagged up kind of in the center of my containment. So I, I go around and I remove everything that I need to remove. Um, and then once it's, you know, once it's bagged up, uh, you're in this, in this, let's just say this containment has a window because we're using a, a negative air situation out that window which during this removal process, you'd want to have it under negative pressure as we touched on before. Ideally, if the containment has a door, that, that, that's great. You can, leave that contain, you can leave that negative air running through a window uh, in a neg- negative pressure, pressure situation. You can open up the door directly going, leading to outside or you know, uh, that would be ideal. Uh, and then you could remove your trash that way. A lot of times uh, we don't have the luxury of having a door. So we'll also uh we'll, what we'll do is we'll after we remove all the trash uh so when I say remove trash when we get the things bagged and kind of the center of the room um I'll run in a HEPA hose and uh we'll kind of do a, a once over HEPA vac on everything and larger particles things like that uh chunks of drywall and we have the um HEPA system out of the truck which basically everything gets sucked to the truck uh and and we have a big HEPA filter on the uh on the machine out there so um, just to clarify for the audience, uh, because I, I want to give kudos to, to you, Dustin. And, and this is something I've talked with some of the colleagues I work with around the country. Uh, Dustin does something that uh, a, a lot of other colleagues uh, do, but are not necessarily spelled out in some of the current standards that are out there. And he, he likes to use local exhaust ventilation. You, that's code for HEPA vacuuming. And he'll, he'll stick that vacuum hose a lot of times when he's doing inspection holes or when they're doing critical work, or like he just mentioned right now for the cleaning um, the canisters outside, uh, and that's critical because we all, uh, well, they're, they're, it's known that um, HEPA vacuums aren't perfect. I mean, if it, if it caught everything that was going through it, the, the vacuum wouldn't work. Uh, it's got to let some air pass, and there's some contaminants that are just so small that they'll go right through even the best of a filter. Uh, not to mention the fact that these machines are built by human. There's bypass issues. There's, other, there's, there's issues that can cause, in fact, I know that 
Dustin has experienced um, at least one um, job where there was a potential vacuum failure. And it, so it happens. And the point is, is that over the years of learning the hard way, we've, we've learned the importance of we're trying to clean this thing up. There could be billions or trillions of various fragments, spores, structures that you want removed from this containment. The numbers are stacked against the remediation company. So anything they can do to minimize aerosolation so that uh, the air, so that the uh, odds are in their favor, they're going to do that. One method that Dustin does a great job, so again, I just want to acknowledge that because I think more sh companies should do it, is when they're running a vacuum cleaner, uh, they stick the actual canister outside and they run a hose at it. Dustin even went one step further. He actually built a custom one so that he could run a longer hose uh, into, the, into the home. Uh, and that's what it took. That's an example of the type of person Dustin is, is where, you know, they didn't have an easily available commercial vacuum that could suck that kind of air from a 30 or 50 foot hose. So uh, Dustin's always been kind of a MacGyver person to me and do it yourself when he created this like system. It's pretty crazy uh, that, that does bring it. So Great, great point. I just wanted to mention that, Dustin. I think a lot of companies miss that, and it's just another good tool that a remediation company can use to just uh, improve the odds that they're going to ultimately get this place cleaned up to a pre-loss condition. Yeah, they they uh, they actually do now uh, make a vacuum that's equivalent to what I made. Um, <laughs> get the patent rights on it. What's that? You get the patent rights no. on it. Oh no, it's it's actually a different setup. Uh, and the, the, the reason I noticed it is um, because uh, they changed the, uh, the way that um, uh, people that do concrete cutting, they now have to be able to capture that dust. Uh, they, they found that it, you know, it can be potentially very harmful for those you know, operating a saw. Sure. So now they have to uh, have a vacuum on it. And so the type of vacuum that they have um, that is equivalent to, to what, I, what I built um, they, they cost about five or six thousand oh, dollars. And wow. so uh, and so I was <laughs> I was able to to do it for significantly less than that. Uh, but it's you know four hundred CFM and we have a two inch uh, hose that we can run about three hundred feet off the truck and take it to pretty much any point of the house to be able to remotely um, you know, basically uh, get the, the, the debris out of there and then if we're exhausting outside of the house, like you said, most even the best manufacturers and I'm not trying to put anybody on the bus but there's a uh, a commercial vacuum company that uh, i've been buying vacuums for for years and that one particular job that you're talking about uh, the hepa filter for that uh, machine was compromised and, and uh you know before this before it had the ability to use this we'd have to basically take apart a hepa vacuum clean it out every time we used it wipe it all down you know get it inside the containment wipe it down get it outside the containment and you're doing that multiple times and and then, you know, the, uh, the HEPA filter actually in the vacuum itself was compromised. And so uh, it was all for now. And so this completely uh, takes that out, that possibility out of the equation. And um, that's what it's about. It's, it's, it's narrowing the equation down to put, you know, stacking the odds in your favor. And when you're looking at that wall in that very first picture right here on the screen, when you can see that much visible mold growth, we're not just talking about a couple hundred spores. We're talking about, I don't know, Mike, you, you, you guesstimate that one. Well, we, we use the analogy, right, that we've used it for a while. Uh, you know, on average, 250 mold spores can fit on the top of a needle pinhead, the kind you sew at. We also recognize that depending on what study you read, you can read anywhere from uh, there being 10 to a million. Usually the more commonly accepted range is 300 to 500 fragments. So imagine that little pretty spore you have. Uh, imagine it busted up into a bunch of fragments or the mycelium or the canidia fours, other parts of the mold. It's not just about mold spores, although most people, that's all we, you hear us talking about. It's such a common go-to, but there's a lot there. And so if you do the math, and I'm not a mathematician, I'm pretty sure you're dealing with the billions and trillions. Okay. So, you know, we, we're talking about billions and trillions of things that potentially are going to fill a, a fill a test in the containment. You know, we have a work cut out for us and um, doing anything that you can to basically, you know, help your odds or put it, things in your favor. And that's one thing that I found that's been very beneficial to me. It's, it's so much easier to wipe a hose down uh, as I'm bringing it into a house with the machine on. And, uh, and, and, you know, basically I can have a vacuum in a, in a whole entire house and not even have to move my vacuum. It stays in the truck. It's great. So, um, so just, and by the way, that photo for you that are, uh, for those of you that are watching right now, we've been talking about this step about, course cleaning. Now this, this picture wasn't staged. I didn't hire a bunch of actors, so you'll have to bear with the examples. But 
uh, you have a HEPA vacuum being used. Uh, what we're talking about using is putting that vacuum outside so that the exhaust of the vacuum and all the components of it that could fail um, are uh, do it so outside and not in, in the home, not in the containment area. But um, the, the vacuuming is really just kind of the first start um, of, the, of the cleaning. We, you've heard different terms on this podcast already, small particle cleaning, environmental cleaning. I like to just dumb this down into we're in the cleaning step. Okay, we've done all this coarse uh, removal of materials in the previous step. Now we're, um, you know, these are all about your expectations. Uh, for those of you listening, the next step is typically some level of cleaning. And this is where, if I could just uh, maybe spend a minute, this is probably where I see the most failure. Uh, certainly containment control, uh, things like that gone awry can cause problems. But where I see a lot of companies fall short of the mark is a lack of detailed cleaning. And there's, there's going to be reasons for that. Um, when we talk about uh, part four, when we get to that about post remediation and validating your work, but the short version is, is there's just not enough cleaning of the surfaces. And so Dustin does a great job uh, doing that once he's done removing the coarse materials using that HEPA vacuum because no one's going to use a Swiffer wipe to wipe down drywall dust and chunks of material, right? That's just not going to happen. Now you're getting into the, the multiple rounds of cleaning. So uh, Dustin, would you mind walking the audience through the part where you, you've done the remediation? You've maybe done the vacuuming to remove course, the course ma uh, materials. Now what? Now what's the next step? So uh, the picture that's on the, on the screen here where you got three gentlemen in the HEPA vac inside of the containment. Um, one, I don't know if my eyes are deceiving me here, but it almost looks like a, a fairly small containment with a mirror. Um, and then uh, you have three guys working in a fairly small containment with the HEPA, HEPA vac. Right. You know, uh, Assuming that somebody took the time to actually clean that HEPA vac out really well before they brought it into the containment, so they're not bringing another job into this containment. Uh, and then, what makes it a little bit uh, a little bit tough too is that um, you know the the multiple bodies in the small containment uh, is tough because you know where does one guy stop and the other guy start? And right. so what I like what <laughs> what I like to do is on these smaller containments is just have one person responsible for it. And that way there's not a, uh, you know, uh, we missed something because, you know, I, I, I thought he got it or he thought I had it, you know, and, and that, that kind of thing. But um, the one thing that uh, in the, the bottom containment there. Um, and just so you know, so don't pick on me, that's actually me doing sampling back in 2008 at a hospital. That was clearance testing. <laughs> but you can use that okay. as an example, Dustin, by the way, if there's some takeaways here. No, I was just going to point out to you that actually in that containment right there, you see that square right above your head? Yeah, I do. That almost, that almost looks like where they put a filter on the outside of it as a relief yeah, uh, it when they had a pressure. Okay, so, yeah, so it's kind of, kind of a common practice. But, yeah, going uh, back to your so, comment earlier about over, over uh, pressurizing containments here in the first picture, I kind of drew my little version of your makeup filter. You can actually see it on the job where the remediation company that was working there put it right there. So great point. There you go. Uh, you know, the, uh, I know we kind of fast forward a little bit through the process, but after you remove uh, drywall, you sand it, uh, you treat it with a, a homeowner approved uh, antimicrobial or agents, whatever it is that you're working with, uh, with that customer, uh, then you can seal it up. Now, once you get to that, uh, I generally like to separate the habitable environment from the non-habitable. So in that wall cavity that we're opening up there, you can see them putting up plastic and that's a prime example of uh, sealing up the, uh, the cavity uh, that runs up the wall, for example, so it's not shared in your containment. I want to um, share something, and I, I, I promise I don't mean to keep interrupting you, but you keep on throwing juicy nuggets at the audience, and I'm like, oh, my God, this is great. Um, so let me just hit on one point, Dustin, on about the disinfectants. There, there, there is a lot. Um, it's not, again, it's tough when, when somebody like Dustin and I are trying to have a 30,000 conver foot conversation because the details matter in what we do every day of the week. And there's a lot of debate on different particular topics, like, for example, disinfectants. I just want to clarify something. Um, source removal is key. And Dustin's already done a great job highlighting on that. There's different uh, methods. There's different uh, chemicals that are used to help with the process. Um, but honestly, what we have found to work the best is uh, the most natural things. I mean, we're not, again, we're not, if we're using a, a chemical, even if it's something like a Dawn dish soap uh, or uh, hydrogen peroxide 3% in a bottle, 
uh, usually it's ultimately to help remove something. We're not trying to say we're killing something and, and, and giving you that narrative that you don't really need to do a good job of physical removal. It's just that sometimes um, those more natural products, think about the dish, the seven generation soap or whatever you're using at your dish sink. This is the type of products we're talking about. D- Dustin and I, uh, and I should rephrase that, Dustin has spent thousands of dollars learning the hard way on, I mean, his track record is one of the best I know, just to be clear, but ev- no one I know has failed uh, not failed a job in terms of clearance testing. That, that's just, that's why you test usually anyway. Um, but in the, in the jobs that we've really got run into problems, it's been complicated. We've spent thousands of dollars of, of our own money in different ways. And he's really gotten the brunt of a lot of that, trying to figure out what was the secret. And we ne- it never was some miracle product. It wasn't some, oh man, this $800 bottle of, 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 of mold X uh, is going to be what works. Uh, that's going to solve all your problems. It's elbow grease. It's wiping it down. And if, uh, for example, you're doing a good job sanding and wiping down of like this lady's doing in the picture here uh, of that particular surface, um, and you uh, the 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 remediation company wants to apply some sort of a homeowner approved uh, disinfectant for the purpose of breaking down something. Again, we're not trying to focus on the killing of it. We're trying to focus on basically just disturbing it, breaking it down so it's not so stubborn. That's fine. The other thing I want to focus on, because I, I know you're probably going to talk about it, separating those critical barriers is key. And I'll let you hit on that. Dustin, I want, I want to people to be aware of there, there's this debate in the industry about applying sealants on studs. And one of the problems that we run into, Dustin, about the timing of it, uh, to, you know, for example, the third edition of the S520 um, says that when you're going to use a, a sealant to, uh, let's say, coat those studs, like in, in the studs that the lady's working on, um, to where maybe it looks like something more in this photo right here, um, that those surfaces need to be checked by the remediation company. And ideally, if you're working with an IEP, they need to be looked at first when you can. It's not a, it's not a you have to, but it's something that we want to start getting into because the issue we're worried about, and I don't worry about this with Dustin, Dustin photographs uh, pretty much all of his work and shows us different stages of what the work they're doing is. We're worried about the remediation company who they've done the cleaning, but they didn't really do a good job cleaning the studs because the technician just found it easier to spray uh, a paint on it and basically encapsulate, which is a word that we don't really like using in this industry. There are there are exceptions where encapsulation is looked at, deviations from the standard that seem to be uh, justified. But we're not trying to hide anything. We're trying to remove it. When you see people putting on sealants, a lot of times it certainly can be arguably a preventative, although you want to prevent mold problem in that wall, you keep it dry. Uh, but what I'm trying to tell you, the other issue is, is sometimes you just can't clean uh, something that's porous like a stud with sanding as much as you think you can. There may be fragments that are just impossibly hard to remove. And so a lot of times companies will apply a sealant or a coating um, to uh, seal that, those onesie or twosies in of part particles so that they aren't a threat anymore. And the only last point I'll make is that if you're going to do that, that is uh, apply a sealant, it's important that you work with the remediation company. Dustin does a fabulous job. Uh, of communicating, you know, here's the products we're going to use. Are you okay with them? Because you don't have to do that. A lot of companies will actually leave the studs looking just like you see them in this picture for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's easier to visually inspect. And the other issue is because um, the argument is, is that you don't know when you add a sealant on, in Arizona, where there's a lot of forgiveness, we don't have a lot of moisture compared to like, say somebody who may be listening right now, who lives in the swamps of Florida. But there's issues of moisture and can this wall breathe? Can this lumber or material breathe? And if I'm putting on a sealant, does it, does it, does it impact or negatively affect the integrity or potential microbial growth in the future? It's a very complicated topic. I'll try to dive into that deeper when we get into the other series. But Dustin, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I know you were talking about uh, critical barriers. I think it's very important to bring that up. I actually had a really good conversation with a couple of colleagues the other day, and, and I think you do a great job doing it. So can you tell the audience about this concept of once you've cleaned these studs, what, why are they setting up these critical barriers? Why would they do that? Why not just leave the wall open? Well, as you notice, the studs, are, they basically run upright. And so most ceiling heights are anywhere from you know, seven, eight feet, you know, right around that, seven, seven to nine feet, let's just say. And so... It is, it is quite possible that 
that uh, wall cavity could run up and actually get some communication from the uh, attic space. Or let's say that it started the roof leak. And because it was a roof leak, we've had to cut a, a portion of the drywall out actually in the ceiling, giving us access into the attic. Well, um, during this, we'd have it under a negative air. And then what would happen to our containment is we'd off obviously lose the negative pressure that we had because now we're sucking air from the attic space into our containment, um, which is fine. I mean, it, but the thing is, is once we uh, address the local area that we want to do and we want to work on, uh, we want to seal it up because when we actually go do our cleaning efforts, if we don't, now we're going to have communication between our containment and the attic space itself. And so the attic space is basically, it's a, an uninhabitable environment. So we don't live in our attic space. We don't breathe that air in there typically. And so we, we don't want to bring that into our containment. It's just, it'd make our life that much harder trying. You know, I mean, we'd have to address the attic space at this point. And generally speaking, our scope of work would be, you know, isolated to that room unless we're hired to get into the attic and do work up there. And that uh, right there for the audience is, is key. What Dustin just said, the, the, the problem is, and, and this may not be a hard topic for some of you, but for others, maybe uh, it is. So I'll just kind of elaborate. The issue is scope of work. When you hired the remediation company, you didn't say, I'd like you to remediate and gut my whole house. That's just not usually the case. Uh, the typical case is the one room, maybe a couple rooms that were impacted, you know, that sort of thing, a kitchen leak here, a window leak in the other bedroom over there. That's your scope. And the problem is, is that it's not a perfect world. And yet you're hiring a company to do remediation in a containment, but there are things that are outside their scope of work. He mentioned the attic as an example that can communicate with his containment area. And that's not fair for him. What, what are we going to do? Are we going to do some testing in here and have it fail and then find out that the reason it was failing was not because of a bad job that the remediation company did. It's because there's another source, but no, it's not that exact. It's not like we can look at that those, um, let's say those mold results and go, oh, well, this one comes with the name tag and clearly this mold came from the attic versus the wall that they cleaned or they scrubbed. So it's an issue of not being able to um, qualify the mold that's found in terms of where it's coming from. So it's very complicated, which is why a lot of companies will, uh, that I work with will at least define their work to say, okay, well, our work was where, if you're looking at the video, is where this uh, four foot open of wall was at. We're going to put almost like a diaper, right? Like this plastic wrap around and, and close those walls up. Uh, not because they're trying to hide anything, but because your scope of work was they had a water leak that was down low that impacted the bottom foot of drywall. And that's where their scope ended. So I've always been a big advocate and defended uh, companies like Dustin and others on that. Not because we don't want you to identify other areas in the home, but understand that your home is not a sterile place. So you're not living in a clean room. Uh, fungal ecology is a normal part of our environment. Without it, we wouldn't be here. Um, there is lumberyard mold on, on uh, you know, you're not, if you have a house that's built out of wood frame and you, you can go to Vegas and bet that we could find a stud that's got lumberyard on it. So it's not about a mold-free environment. It's about normal fungal ecology. And more specifically, it's more about what's the net result of all of it. Okay, I listen, I have an attic. But my attic is not as, you know, it's got insulation. When you're not up there jumping around and breathing it in, you can understand that concept. But you're also not really freaking out about it, even though you know that there could be a particle or two or three or more that could come into the home. And so um, critical barriers are uh, uh, <laughs> critical uh, if for me where, and, and I don't just, critical barriers also protect other things like these pictures don't really do it justice. But uh, in the first picture, um, you could see there's a fireplace over here and they tried to tape off and plastic off that uh, area because they, they didn't want there to be communication uh, coming in. Or if there was an example here, uh, I'll go ahead and draw it on since I seem to be pretty uh, good at it. Uh, if there was a register on a wall, a lot of times a company will uh, put plastic, that's a critical barrier too, over it, especially if it's in like a containment, right? Uh, to protect it from cross-contaminating. So they're, they're really trying to do a good job for you, but it's really important to understand that you didn't hire them to gut your entire house. And because of that, they have to define what work they're doing and what work they're not doing. Um, Dustin, you get to the part where you set up the critical barrier. Um, you've done that, you've done the cleaning. I know we've talked about, um, and I know I had skipped over it before, which is why you went back to it. When's the, you, you do the HEPA vacuuming. I know you keep your HEPA uh, vacuum equipment outside. Can you walk the audience through the rounds of cleaning and in what order you do them? All right. So once you, once you set the, uh, um, once you put up your plastic and you, and you separate habitable from the uninhabitable areas, um, at this point, they're sealed up. And so, you know, we're, 
we've already gone through um, kind of uh, preliminary cleaning, which is HEPA vacuum and, and maybe even some wet wiping uh, before the before things were sealed up. But um, at this point, we have we have our plastic up. We separate the habitable from the inhabitable. Um, we're going to do a round of HEPA cleaning in there, and then we'll do a round of uh, a wet cleaning. And uh, what we'll wet generally clean. do? What's that mean? Well, a wet clean. So a wet clean is using um, it could be anything from borax soap and water or a Dawn detergent water, or Perfect. it could be, uh, or Benefact, uh, uh, you know, or, or, you know, something of that nature. Uh, I want to say that, uh, just to catch you up on your cleaning that you're at the point where you're doing the wet wiping. I know Dustin mentioned a couple product names. We don't have any affiliation with, uh, any, any products or, or we're not promoting or not promoting any particular product. I just want to make something clear that cause Dustin doesn't give himself enough credit. Dustin talks about the chemicals he uses and there's plenty of clients he uses where, you know, he has had success. I mean, there was a time where, you know, I've seen that product that he mentioned uh, used in a hospital with success. But we also know that with environmentally acquired illness patients, uh, they, they may not be able to even deal with the, the phenols and the, uh, the, the, um, the thyme oil and, and stuff that, you know, I know is labeled as green. Um, it, 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 and, and there's even questions about it, what its efficacy as a surfactant versus, you know, disinfectant. Here's the takeaway. You're, you're, when you're working with your remediation company and Dustin does this, uh, with the clients, you're, you're talking about, here's things we can use, but with people that have a chronic illness, we really do start to lean more and more and that, and this is very live. It's very real time. Meaning this topic is not something we've talked about 10 years ago. It's something that's come up in the last year or two and even continues to use simpler and simpler chemicals. Uh, so maybe it is, Don, he had mentioned Don dish soap. Uh, that, that's a great popular product because we know it's a surfactant. Again, it's not about killing. We're trying to physically remove in the end. And so we're, we're hoping that something like that can aid in the process. But one of the concerns we have, and Dustin knows this better than I do, is we want to be careful not, you know, some people grow up with, well, a little bit of soap in the water to make, you know, like this Dawn soap mixture is good, so more must be better. And that's not exactly true. It's funny how we try to clean containments up, um, but in the process, we may leave things behind like films and things like that. Now, it's impossible to uh, expect a remediation company to not leave a little bit of soap film. But the goal is, is just to get that water soapy enough to have the lightest of films, not enough to where you're seeing like bubbles from the water stain on the wall so that they can use it to wipe down the surfaces. Once they get done with that wet wiping, you may find that some companies, if they even do that, they're done. They're, they they kind of wipe their hands clean and say, we're ready. But uh, with people who have environmentally uh, acquired illnesses, that sort of thing, um, the, we, we find that that's not enough. It's multiple rounds of cleaning because there's things that have been in the air that are now going to settle out, um, that sort of thing. Dustin, can you walk them through after the wet wipe now that everyone has a better understanding of that? Are you, are you doing like a couple rounds of that or do you switch to dry wiping? How does it work now? So what we typically do is, is the process, HEPAVAC, uh, wet wipe, and then uh, at that point, I would uh, change filters. I put things, uh, you know, had it not already been done, I'd, I'd make sure at that point we're uh, putting the equipment into a, you know, an air scrub position and putting our, our lay flat out in the containment. Um, and then we'd want to let things settle out. So um, it's really not cost effective to have my guys hang out on your driveway for about three hours to let things settle out. So we typically will get to that point out of the day and then we'd call it a day come back the next morning and you know things have had time to settle out um and then a lot of times uh first thing you do when you walk into another contain uh, the containment the next day is um wet wipe the floor first and then uh wet wipe the walls let things dry down enough to where you can start doing your dry wiping um once you have done a couple dry wipes on there generally speaking you're you're pretty much good to go at that point um dry yeah, wipes uh, no chemicals uh, well, it, so it depends on the, depends on the customer. And, um, one thing that, um, one thing that I want to touch base on too, is that, you know, the remediator that's coming out to your home to do the work. Um, what I do with my customers is when I sign up the job, I have a part on our work authorization that talks about uses of antimicrobials. And so what I'll do is I will have MSDS sheets for the use 
and I will uh, go over them with you, explain to you what they are, and then uh, you know, and, and the, you can either do a sniff test if you have uh, MCS, or you can choose not to, or you can just tell me no. I I prefer we don't use this, but we use this, and um, we, always, we always come to a, a, a solution uh, to figure it out. Whatever whatever the product is going to be is going to be. Uh, I but remember what. Test. But remember what Dustin said earlier. It's not about killing; it's about removing. So when your remediation company is coming out there and there's, you know, they're explaining to you, which makes perfect sense, especially when you look at the amount of money that you and or your insurance policy is uh, going to be spending. You need to know what they're bringing into, and really, you're going to be wanting to see that per predominantly. Again, this is the thirty thousand foot, or at least we're trying to make it a broad overview of what a remediation project looks like. Uh, we'll dive deeper into some of the concerns we have with different chemicals and and whatnot in in later in the series. But the takeaway here is that if if you start to hear somebody that's talking about products that are only intended to kill. It, it should raise up a couple of yellow flags. The yellow first flag is like, well, what are you doing to physically remove? And and then a second flag would be, are you if you're going to use some chemicals, why wouldn't you use something that's a surfactant or has the ability to lift or lo loosen the surface tension of say a particle on a surface so that it, you can lift it off? I mean, it's why when you throw a dirty dish in the dishwasher, you put in some, uh, soap and that's a surfactant and it does a great job, you know, removing, uh, helping to remove those stubborn particles. It's the same concept. And again, just to, 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 give, um, to give praise where justified, Dustin does do a really good job. I, I talked to Dustin earlier uh, about being broad and trying to talk more for the average remediation company. But the thing that is important for this audience to understand is that we, you are taking the time to talk about these. And no, we're not advocating that you have to sniff a bottle of something. It's just Dustin's having real talk with you. There are times where we really just don't know if any product is good because if we are dealing with somebody who's chemically sensitive, Dawn dish soap may not be uh, an option. Yeah. And, and it's, work, it's working backwards to say, here's what I know works the best for me in the remediation field. Here's what, you know, and I would say, argue, keep it simple, keep it, keep it natural, you know, Dawn dish soap for, for wiping down. It doesn't have to be expensive. Elbow grease, um, even hydrogen peroxide to help with a little bit of disinfectant, but we're not we're not trying to spray some sort of an antimicrobial on your surfaces that uh, you're going to be touching and living in as if that's the solution. The solution is to keep the place dry and prevent that water leak from happening again, right? So just wanted to make a point uh, because Dustin, t he's being tasked with trying to fly at 30,000 feet to broadly talk about topics. And unfortunately, some of them are loaded with it depends and it and, and it's not easy to answer and and I want to I want to give credit where credit's due that Dustin does a great job doing that so sorry Dustin well let me uh, let me simplify it a little bit more whatever remedial company you're going to work with make sure you get copies of MSDS sheets on, on whatever agent they plan I don't like these word chemical I like these word agent whatever agent they plan on using uh, in the remedial process um, just make sure that you're well versed with it and uh, for those that have chemical sensitivities, um, I would rather somebody sniff, uh, you know, a cap full of something outdoors uh, than me come in and bring something in their house and take it on chance. And then they go, oh my gosh, this stuff is killing me. Right. So um, a, a little bit of exposure outdoors uh, uh, and just a little whiff test might prevent uh, a whole catastrophe, which I've had happen in the past, if I'm being blunt uh, and honest. I mean, it's... Um, you just never know what one's tolerances are. We're all different and we can all handle different things and what smells good to me might smell awful to you or vice versa. And so um, go through and if you have a product that you really, really like, like uh, for example, I've had a customer uh, hand me seven generations dish soap and say, I want you to, you know, do a wipe down with this. Um, even better, they're, they're providing what they want me to use and, and I just need to use it in an appropriate manner. Uh, and figure out how I can work that into my process for well which um, I can uh, basically appease them uh, with their expectations, but then make sure that I can get the job done. Now, if they, if they hand me something uh, that is absolutely useless, uh, I need to speak up and say, you know, this is probably not the best thing to use. And, uh, you know, like if you handed me a bottle of spray Lysol or something, I mean, it just, it, 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 there's, um, there's certain deal breakers. 
Yeah, there, there's certain things. I mean, it, you know, it, it, there's there's an absolute, you know, you're, you want me to do this, but you're tying my hands because you're telling me to do the best job that I can possibly do, but then you're tying my hands and not allowing me to do what I need to do. That's, that's a whole nother conversation, but it is relevant in this. Um, there are uh, many times where I've used hydrogen peroxide. Uh, we've used borax. We've used center, seven generations. Uh, I've used um, mold control, which is uh, so, uh, um, uh, basically a liquid, liquefied salts. Um, we've fogged, uh, you know, multiple different products. Um, we've tried numerous different things. Um, with the the intention and the and the purpose, all is basically removing any contaminants that we can possibly remove inside the in the in the containment. Right. Um, and whatever whatever is your vehicle to get you to the final destination, just make sure it's well discussed and versed between you and your remedial company. That probably is probably probably the most important um, thing of all of it, even more than the work, is that communication. Like you can even see how it's tricky for Dustin and I to to attempt to make this four part series and not dive into, even though the first part's this overview. It's so easy to dive into it because it's it's learning the hard way. It's learning from experience and it's knowing that not one method. Certainly, there's general fundamentals that we've just already discussed that are going to be pretty in line all the time. But the details that matter. Um, let me see if I can just, I know we're getting close to the end. I want to kind of switch gears a little bit. I know we get to the part where, you know, to, again, for the audience members, now what? They've done this cleaning. They're done. There's no law that requires you to do, uh, that I'm aware of uh, in, these, in the states here, that require you to do testing, but a lot of people will opt to. Uh, it's a way to have an independent company, not the remediation company that did their own work. Uh, test that work. Um, we're not going to get into the details of of how and what because that's a loaded topic and not one formed for this particular uh, cast. But I will say that it is an option. Um, I'll tell you that a lot of companies, Dustin will do this, is they'll do their own, certainly they'll validate uh, their own work by having their technicians or if Dustin's there, will walk out and do a visual assessment. They'll do, he'll do like a white or black glove test where he's looking for dust emissions, basically looking to see, I mean, does it look like this place has been environmentally cleaned or uh, did, does, do we need to go back and do another round before um, we call it good or before we say we're ready for testing to the client? Um, beyond that, um, and, and, and something that, again that Dustin and I have been in the trenches working with is, just the topic about just knowing and explaining the limitations of your work. And I have a few b bullet points I'm actually staring at uh, right now um, on, on my cheat sheet. Um, there's no guarantees in this work. Um, we're, we're tasked with trying to remediate a uh, perceived risk of exposure. Um, we've been picking on mold and microbial growth a lot here, and, and that's fine. It comes up a lot. And the idea of saying that, yeah, we understand as, as a species, I think we all can qualify the idea that, we don't want mold in our wall. I mean, when you're able to show an audience uh, pictures like that of mold, no one really is going to argue that, yeah, that should be removed. Um, but it's not like it comes with a guarantee. Like, you know, your, your body is just as, if not more complicated uh, than, the, than the home. And, you know, uh, presumably you're going to get better with rem remediation, but sometimes clients, and, and through it's, it's through their own, just that layman, that lack of understanding and and then asking professionals who have the reputation to know, but even us, we're, we're tip of the spear. Um, we're constantly learning about the sciences, um, you know, in the weeds of all of it, that, you know, it may not result in instant success. And so you can't come out there thinking that a remediation company is going, their, 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 their goal is to clean this back to a pre-loss state. And you'll hear that term. And pre-loss is the only way they can explain to it is imagine if this wall had never experienced a water loss. We're trying to return it to that state. And they're using those words particularly because they're not trying to say that they're going to sterilize a wall cavity or a ceiling or a kitchen, a kitchen sink cabinet. But, but we're all faced with challenges because we're, we're not just remediating the stuff we can see, right? We're cleaning the stuff that we can't see. There's other challenges. And you heard another big one. This was a bullet point I'm staring at right now. We've already kind of talked about it, which is the clean challenges with cleaning products. Um, you know, some of the listeners uh, that are, are hearing this uh, may have had great experience with some of the products that are loosely mentioned. And I guarantee you there's going to be product uh, people out there that hear, you know, we used uh, cer certain names that maybe they don't think is uh, appropriate and they bring the science. Like it's not even known to be a good surfactant. The argument here isn't to promote any particular product. It's more about the process and the intent. And the intent is removal and typically surfactants and different products that uh, are designed to be a surfactant will help the remediation company 
remove uh, the, the particles that are settling out on the surfaces that uh, say the uh, air filtration device that's running in this, uh, he's been using the term HEPA scrubber, uh, is scrubbing the air, not removing, or uh, if you're using a fogging product to drop particles out of the environment to be wiped up. It's just, it, it, it's, you're hitting the environment from multiple angles to do a total clean. The other issue we run into is budget. And this is probably, uh, probably one of my final points before we close out today is, is gets in the way, I'm guessing only 99% of the time. Uh, it's, it's to the, uh, Dustin made this concept. Uh, well, he actually made a couple comments earlier. One was the person that hands the checkbook. Um, he, what he didn't say, and I thought he was going to say, is that one of the other reasons it bothers us is because we don't feel comfortable with that. If you're one of those people that says, here, just have my checkbook and do what you need, that, that's not going to speed your process up because that's going to actually make us more worried about your lack of being involved. You need to be involved in the process. Uh, you need, you, 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 if you have cognitive issues or other issues going on, then you need to have a representative there to help make decisions and record things because this is, everything's all well and good when everything works out per some perceived expectation. But the second it goes awry, then all, then all hell breaks loose. And it doesn't happen that often with people like myself and Dustin. We've learned over the years, but you'll have companies out there where just a simple lack of communication, mold remediation and mold assessments is not some sort of a, a big box store purchase that you just press a button, buy a thing off the shelf, and then you know you have all your answers. It's a very complicated, complex science that uh, influences the home. I mean, even why these guys are doing environmental cleaning under containment, the outdoor environment, outside of that house, go back to this photo right here, uh, the outdoor environment, the particles, molds, plant fibers, you name it, anything that's outside is getting into that containment, I guarantee it. It's, it's not, it's, we don't live in a bubble. And so it's understanding those, those limitations and those sciences, which is why communication is key. Uh, Dustin offered to help out if you have questions uh, and he has the time, I'm sure he'll be happy to, to talk with you about some, some guidelines. But the budget, going back to budget, that's huge because a lot of folks will work, will call and have an issue in their home and it will legitimately to do a really, you know, God's honest, good work uh, in, in the world that we live in, it may cost five or $10,000 for, you know, a single type loss or maybe a double loss or a complicated loss where there's expensive cap and tree uh, at, 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 you know, in the, in the way. It, to communicate that up front with the remediation company, because a lot of times the remediation companies can say, okay, well, you can't afford to do this. Maybe we can come at this angle here. We can address this wall from the backside or going back to Dustin's credit about baseline testing to help provide scope of work. There may be a situation where even though there is significant damage in the kitchen sink, maybe it's kind of in that gray area, right? It's there, but it's not like you have a big mold monster growing uh, in that bottom shelf that may be a cavity sample or some other sort of exploratory, non -intr uh, minimally intrusive uh, approach to address that cabinet or that wall behind it is appropriate to justify the money. But you want to be, the takeaway here is that you don't want to skimp on these fundamentals. If you're going to do remediation, don't skimp by saying, well, I'm going to do it, but instead of having somebody with credentials uh, who's been doing it for a while, I'm going to hire the guy that sells hot dogs during the day and he's a mold remediation company at night. You don't want flybys because if you are one of those people who go on social media or you're on other groups and you hear horror stories about remediation projects gone bad, if you dive into the details, a lot of the reason was um, there was a lack of communication and understanding. Uh, there was a lack of cleaning. These are things is why you're asking them to explain what are the steps. We talked about some of those fundamentals of what that looks like. What are they doing? Are they even setting up a containment that's truly a containment? I've walked out to remediation projects where the bottom of the containment, imagine this photo right here, if the plastic was hanging off the ceiling like a curtain, it was literally one inch off the ground. It was not connected or sealed. It looked like a shower curtain. And that is not a containment. And then they wonder why the area outside the containment failed. Uh, when we did our own testing on the back end of this remediation project. So budget is, uh, is important. Dustin, um, for you, man, you are definitely in the weeds. Uh, you're more in the weeds with this topic because of the nature of your work than I am. Uh, any tidbits that you can give the audience if they're on? Uh, no one, first of all, just to be clear, no one raises their hand and say, oh, wait, I love, I want to spend tons of money on mold remediation. But you know what I'm talking about. The people that are on a legitimate tight budget what are some of the resources they can do? How can they reach out to people or what suggestions do you have uh, to help them get through that difficult uh, decision? 
Oh, wow. Uh, well, first and foremost, um, I think in any project that you do, um, to have a good IUP uh, in your corner, uh, someone like Mike uh, that can help you out with potentially a scope of work um, or testing to determine, you know, a baseline. It's, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of a loaded question, Mike, because the when I, when I first think about, you know, all the people that potentially could be listening to this are in different areas. You're not, you know, they're not right here in Tucson or Phoenix, you know, and they're, they're out of my service area. However, um, if I were to look to hire a, a remedial company, what I'd probably do is I'd probably contact any of the local testers in my area. And I'd probably just ask them, I got mold in my house. I need to find a company that, uh, you know, and trust and does a good job. And, you know, call all of them, find out, you know, who is the common denominator as far as the remedial company and then uh, and then get them out there and, and then have a one to one, you know, face to face with them and, and go over things, um, you know, find out if they're licensed, bonded, insured, things like that. Um, what kind of certifications they have. And then you have it all on the screen here. Look at that. Um, and then basically uh, ask them for an estimate. And. Um, you know, the, there's there's a lot of a lot of things that were, you know, Mike, you covered a lot of ground. Uh, you know, Sorry, going brother, back I know. Their- That's why these people are going to thank me for it being a recording. They can go back to it. Well, let's start simple. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll do well, this. Well, well, they if they don't have a budget. If they don't have a budget, they a lot of people don't realize that they have a community of people they can reach out to. They're if they're uh, if they have a spiritual, you know, church they can go to. People are are willing to help, and you have to understand that. And whether you feel helpless, or, uh, which may be the case, Dustin and I work with, I don't know, I don't want to make the number up. I want to be real. Uh, one client every week or two will be in a financial situation where you'll find out they, they reached out to family or friends or their community to help with the budget. And that's on top of, I mean, you can't expect the remediation company to do pro bono work. Uh, they have bills to pay. He, he's got employees to pay who have families and just like you. Um, but I think you can reach out to that community and help. And I've seen you do this. I mean, I know this podcast isn't about advanced drying, but I mean, I've seen you do things that you're not a good example of the average remediation company. You, you, you help out, but you've learned nuggets. You've learned things. You can reach out to the church. Uh, you can reach out to your, your fellow friend or brother to help them because you know, that's what you need. There, there is a, um, you know, there is a community out there uh, and there are a lot of really good people left in this earth. And, uh, um, you know, I, I don't really like to boast or talk about what I do and how I've done things in the past, but I, I am involved with um, church and my community. And I've, I've actually done uh, numerous jobs for people that I go to church with. Um, and, you know, some projects turn out great. Some projects, you know, I, I had one in particular where, um, we weren't, we didn't quite get the result that we we're looking for. And, and it just made that, it made things a little bit harder. And it's, you know, it's, it, um, it can certainly add to the, the difficulty and the dynamic. However, um, it, it, you can, you can find people that are willing to bend and not break and, and are willing to help. And, and, um, uh, you know, it, the, there is a part two of, of the care of it. Um, I, I do something a little bit different than most companies, um, uh, Mike was mentioned earlier that there's no guarantees. And one of the things that I do is if, if one of our containment, containment spells on, under direct sampling, um, we'll go back in, we'll do whatever we got to do and uh, reclean it if, if there's a, a lack of our effort or if there was uh, you know, something that we missed or what have you, um, I'll get back in there, I'll do whatever I need to do to make it right, and then I'll pay for the retest, um, which I know a lot of people don't do. And uh, so we try to be different and, uh, and we have our own caveats and how we work and, and how we, how we do things in the flow. And, um, yeah, I just, I've been, I've been blessed. I don't do any advertising. Uh, all my business is word of mouth and, uh, I just try to take care of the people that we, uh, we come across. And the other thing I'll add to that, uh, is that, uh, listen, if we had, a uh, if we had the secret for you, um, you have $0 and you have $20,000 in remediation. There's not always an easy answer for that. But one of the things that you can do is you can reach out um, to professionals. Um, <clears throat> great way to start uh, ACAC, which is if you're again looking at that screen, uh, their logo there, uh, ACAC, that's Alpha Charlie, alphacharlie.org. You can go on there and um, 
um, go to the find certificates, <clears throat> type in your zip code and see if there's somebody in your area. You'll have to do a little bit of your own research. Um, make some phone calls. You, if you're watching the screen right now, you can see some basic questions and you've kind of gotten the theme of what to expect as a 30,000 foot. We'll be talking more about that in the follow-up series uh, that you can ask these companies if they do. Another great website is uh, the, I, the IICRC. Uh, I believe they have a search field. You can go online for them and see if they have, again, you're just looking for people that show uh, do they are they do they have some basic level of certificate and they're not just some fly by night that's got some sort of a three day mold workshop that doesn't really amount to any credit uh, certifying them for more than that. I mean, what is their what are their years in the field? What what is their experience? Do they have any experience working with environmentally acquired illness? And we'll be doing a podcast in the near future uh, that talks about building the village and 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 finding those professionals. It's geared more towards clinicians, but it absolutely will impact you, especially if you have a clinician you're working with. Uh, who doesn't have a village of professionals. This is who we're talking about right now. Um, but uh, the other thing I was going to say is you can go to those sites. You can go to IC, uh, International Society for Environmentally Acquired Illness. And actually, it's pronounced ICI. I got corrected on that. They weren't sure in the past. But it's IC.org. Or you can even go to survivingmold.com. Um, there are great resources on both of those sites to look for professionals. It's not necessarily to fly somebody in to do the remediation work, you may find somebody on those sites in your area. But um, even if you can't, what I do a lot of phone consults on now uh, with my other work is um, guiding people. Uh, I, I, I learn about their situation and um, you, you know, you kind of come up with a game plan for them and you basically, they're the supervisor, the client, but you guide them with the fundamentals of what they should expect or maybe they they do find the local remediation company and the local remediation company did provide them with an estimate and an overview of what they're going to do, but you're not sure that you feel too confident with it. You don't know all the steps that they make sense. Now, you're not going to fly somebody like me or another company in uh, to do that type of uh, overview or oversight, but maybe you can spend a minimal, literally a minimal amount of work for the knowledge you're going to get to say potentially sales. And so you do have options uh, beyond uh, financial reaching out to the community to really help guide you. And, and that's important because I wouldn't have spent this much time talking about it if it wasn't for the fact that probably 50% of the people I work with, and I work with about eight to 12 clients a day uh, in the week, um, they are complaining to that to some capacity. So I imagine that for some of you listening, it's a very real uh, topic. Um, in closing, uh, I just want to say that again, this is a part one of part four series. So uh, part two is going to be coming up uh, soon. We'll be talking more about kind of containments and setups and some of the engineering controls and a, a closer look at that to help guide you. Uh, part three is going to get more into the details, into the weeds of remediation and cleaning. We'll start to do a little bit more. Um, we may even make it a open mic uh, podcast where we just kind of do more of a soundboarding approach, uh, kind of like a coffee shop talk um, that we've done here before on the podcast. Uh, and then when we get into uh, uh, the, uh, the fourth part or final part, we're going to get into the post remediation validation, verification of the work, what your options are. Dustin mentioned earlier that sometimes he gives a, a hold harmless. It's not, he's, not, he's not trying to say, hey, I may have done a crappy work and you can't hold me responsible for it. What he's trying to say is that sometimes people uh, don't want to do the testing or can't afford to do the testing. And it's not uncommon for a remediation company to offer that to say, well, listen, then you can't hold me responsible for something that you chose not to do a third party testing to validate that. And I know it's kind of a, a, a touchy tub, uh, topic depending on what angle you're coming from. So that's why we're going to make that a fourth and final part of this uh, four part series. Um, I want to thank Dustin uh, for coming on the show today to talk with us. Uh, as you can see, it's a very complicated uh, uh, topic. Uh, it's a very passionate one. It's, and um, arguably you could probably go on this podcast for months if we were to even uh, touch more than just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's involved. Um, if you uh, have any questions, especially if you're Arizona based, uh, Tucson, Phoenix, uh, I know that Dustin services that area. Uh, I can vouch that uh, he's a great uh, company out there. There are others out there. Um, if you have questions, um, want to uh, give him a, a, a shout out, you've got a, a call number there on the top right of the screen, 520-790-7800. Uh, give him a ring. I'm sure he'd be happy to help you as able. Dustin, thank you again for today. And I look forward to uh, talking to you on the rest of the series. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate having me on. All right. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next time.
The content of this show is for informational purposes and represents the sole opinion of the host and its interviewees only. Any reliance on the information provided in this show is done at your own risk. Additional opinions and or research may change our current view of the topics spoken in this show. We do our best to minimize any inaccuracies presented and make legitimate efforts to back all comments with our own field experience, independent literature, or studies that support the topics discussed. This information should not be used to make conclusive decisions regarding your health or exposure. Ultimately, all questions and or concerns regarding your health should be addressed by a qualified physician. Additional exposure concerns and or questions pertaining to the health of your home or building should be addressed by qualified and on-site professionals. Any and all products and services discussed in this show should not be construed as a recommendation, endorsement, or guarantee that their use is appropriate for your situation. In short, we hope this information is of value to you, but please do not act upon it without actual and individual consultation and guidance by professionals who have taken the time and appropriate collection of data to assess your unique situation.